Mr. Groon began Groon's Guitars in 1970, is that right, Mr. Groon? And uh, has been just a mainstay, a staple of the music industry, uh, not only in Nashville, but worldwide since then. Uh, Mr. Groon's, you know, it's very rare that you can say that someone is a worldwide foremost expert on a subject matter, but these two guys here today, we can, we can say that. And uh, it's pretty, pretty neat to have them with us today. Uh, Mr. Green is an expert on all kinds of well, all kinds of subjects, but especially when it comes to vintage instruments, the history, um, the trends, and where it's going from here. And we're going to talk about all that today. Uh, Mr. Spann literally wrote the book on pre-war Gibson banjos. There's a <coughs> guide to Gibson. Did you bring any books with you today, Joe? <coughs> no, you know I never had any. They didn't give me any for some reason, <laughs> but they sent me a check two times. Okay. So <laughs> well, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it on all kinds of uh, vendors out there. So I encourage you to check out Spans Guide to Gibson, um, which is referenced by Gibson to learn about their own selves. They go to Mr. Span to learn about their own history. Um, anyway, without further ado, I would like to introduce Mr. George Groon. Good morning. I'd also like to say very quickly, if you have any spare time in town or next time you're here, be sure and go to Groon's guitars, uh, one of the most welcoming places in town, and uh, you won't find another collection of instruments anywhere around like Mr. George has. Thank you for being here, George. Okay, hello everybody. I started uh, collecting instruments, particularly guitars, but also banjos and mandolins in 1963, and that was sort of at the tail end of the big folk music boom. Uh, there was a folk boom from about 59 to 63, followed by 64, the Beatles arrived, and then you had Beatles and Rolling Stones and that rock movement, and then 69 through about 75, there was a lot of folk rock, Crosby, Stills, Nash and & Young, and Grateful Dead and a bunch of others. But even before I ever started collecting or playing, I was still familiar with music. I had friends who were into that movement so that uh, I graduated high school in 63, but all through that time that I was in high school, I had friends who played and I got to see a lot of good instruments long before I ever played a note on one. But what I was really obsessed with before that from as soon as I was old enough to walk and talk, my father took me on nature walks. He was a pathologist, but he was interested in teaching me all about zoology. And uh, I was out with him collecting insects by the time I was four, getting frogs and turtles when I was about six. Caught my first snake when I was eight, and I've had snakes ever since. I've got about 20 snakes in my office right now. My Cuban babe, boas have a litter. If anybody visits, you can see mom and dad, Cuban boa, and you can see some of the babies. But getting on to banjos, Gibson didn't start out as a banjo company. They didn't make a banjo till 1918, but Orville Gibson was making instruments in the 1890s, and in 1902, and Joe will go into some more detail on that, uh, Lewis Williams, a, a Kalamazoo businessman, and some of his <coughs> associates got together and decided that they could get Orville to design instruments and they could buy the rights to his patent design and they hired him. Uh, he didn't turn out to be a very good employee. A lot of uh, luthiers are temperamental artists and not well suited to the kind of work that one would punch a time clock for. And Orville was uh, one such type, but Orville had designed carved top carved back mandolins and guitars, which was something quite revolutionary at that time. And so they started the company in 02, and it was quickly very successful for mandolins. But the mandolin orchestra boom 
got to be really big. It was actually started with a group called the Spanish Students that came over and they were playing mandolin size instruments, but they were Span Spanish banderillas. They really weren't mandolins at all. But it initiated a mandolin boom in the U.S. Instead of buying banderillas, everybody wanted mandolins. And mandolin is tuned like a violin. And Gibson came up later than shortly after the opening of the company. They, the so-called tenor mandola, which was tuned like a viola. The Italians hadn't made viola, the viola tuning mandolas. They had made octave mandolins, and they made piccolo mandolins. And they, but they didn't actually make instruments that were tuned like the Gibson mandolin family with mandolin, mandola, mandocello, and mando bass. But the mandolin market after World War I virtually collapsed. That's something Gibson hadn't counted on. And Dixieland music became popular. And that utilized tenor banjos. Didn't utilize five strings like most of us here today want to play. The five-string banjo was really popular starting as far back as in the 1840s. But they were basically an instrument of originally African origin. And it went from a gourd with a tacked-on head to a round rim with a tacked-on head to a round rim with brackets and a tension hoop that you could tighten the head. But uh, they were played with gut strings. And prior to about 1880, almost all of them were fretless. Gibson was not really trying to capitalize on the five-string banjo movement because that so-called classical era banjo movement that had banjo orchestras with piccolo banjo, banjarines, standard banjos, alto banjo, and even bass banjo all in five string was a movement that really was very popular from the 1880s. Before 1880s, it was more minstrel music. But from at least the 1880s through about 1905, five string banjo was indeed popular, but it was for classic style banjo. You can hear some good recordings of that uh, even YouTube and uh, other sources. Uh, Fred Van Epps, the father of the jazz player George Van Epps, was a phenomenal player and played finger picking style every bit as complex as anything Earl Scruggs ever did. But it was on gut strings and it wasn't bluegrass. It wasn't country, but it was still five string banjo. But Gibson, when they started banjos in 1918, were responding to the rise of Dixieland. And also they were responding to the falling sales of mandolins and the fact that archtop guitars, which Gibson never called archtop, that term doesn't seem to show up in any literature till about 1931, but it doesn't show up in any pre-war Gibson catalogs. They don't call them archtop guitars. It's a carved top to them, or a graduated top. But archtop is a term we use today, and it does show up in some literature as early as the early 30s, but not when it was first introduced by Orville or in the early Gibson days. But at any rate, Gibson needed something, because guitar sales for Gibson were low. Most people who wanted a guitar still wanted a flat top guitar, and orchestral rhythm was not a big deal for guitar in the 1920s. It was a huge deal in the 1930s, starting with the crooners, players like Eddie Lang, who sometimes considered the father of the archtop guitar, but if it hadn't been for the rise of Dixieland, Gibson would not have gotten into banjo because basically clawhammer players and early country music players typically had one thing in common. They had no money. And Gibson instruments were not cheap. 
uh, a Gibson L5 guitar in 1924, their top of the line model was $275 and $25.50 for the case. So $300.50 with a case. In 1924, a Model T car from Ford was 265 and you didn't need a case. <laughs> so if you think that Maybell started out uh, with the Carter family in uh, the Bristol Sessions on an L5, you'd be wrong. She had a Stella that cost about $5. She didn't get the L5 until they got their royalty checks, whereupon they went out and they bought the most expensive guitar in the Gibson catalog. And I doubt she'd ever even seen one before getting it because they would have had to order it because I can't imagine that the store in Kingsport just carried that as a standard stock item. At any rate, when Gibson started out making banjos in 1918, their designs were nothing resembling a master tone, certainly not heavily influenced by five string. They made mandolin banjos, tenor banjos, plectrum banjos, but mostly tenor and a few five strings. And they also had some strange designs. They had a uh, rim design that they licensed from Kraske that was actually a hollow rim that uh, I don't have a sample of that, but it's a, a design that they quickly abandoned. But they did come out uh, by the early, or actually by about 1922, the so-called trapdoor resonator. This is a 1924 original five-string RB3. Now, most of you folks, when you think of an RB3, you're not thinking of something that looks like this. But this is fully original, except, well, it has a new bridge, and it has a plastic head, and it's got new strings. But otherwise, it's original in every respect. Original finish, original tuners, into the trapdoor tone ring, or excuse me, resonator. It's just flat, no sides, has a hinge, and you can set it, a little clip that you can put it on the coordinator rod. It does have coordinator rods, two of them, similar enough to a master tone. And it does not have screws and bracket shoes through the rim. It does have a tube, and later the master tone had a tube and a flat plate. And then later yet, in 29, they came out with the one-piece flange. But this precedes the master tone. It does have a tone ring that uh, is in there. It's uh, similar to the master tone ball bearing tone ring, but uh, but this does have a tone ring, and it has the coordinator rods rather than a wood dowel. But this is still a banjo that did not catch on big. It has a ten and a half inch head diameter, and lots of makers did not have eleven inches. Bacon and Day had eleven. Vega made a whole bunch of different sizes. They had. Uh, 10 and 3 quarters, 10 and 15 sixteenths, 11 and a half, and 11 and 13 sixteenths. But with hide heads, they didn't worry too much about standardization of head sizes. But this is 1924 RB3. Now, I also brought a 1925 RB3. Here be a 1925 RB3, same model designation, one year apart. Looks a little different. It's got the fiddle-shaped peg head. It has the diamond-shaped inlays. It has a modern-looking resonator, and it has the so-called ball-bearing tone ring, which Joe can explain more about later.
but this still looks pretty much like a bluegrass banjo. They did not make very many five-string RB3s. They made lots of TB3 tenors, but this particular instrument is 1925, and it is in the first work order batch of style three master tones. So this is about as early as it gets for a master tone banjo. And it certainly looks like, I, I would think that most of you would look at this versus this, and you'd think that Gibson must have had some brilliant designers and that they obviously were not doing well with the trapdoor design. And uh, they needed to come up with something because the trapdoor models compared to a Bacon or a Vega or a Paramount just didn't sound good. They didn't look good. They didn't sound good. They just didn't put out much sound, yes, Joe's. Here we have, so uh, after thinking that uh, they must have had brilliant designers, look at this. Do you see a resemblance? There's a little too much resemblance for it to be pure coincidence. You know, what looks sort of like a raised head tone ring, and that's ball bearing, and this has a tube supported on struts, but it gives a raised head look, so does that. And the inlays are mighty similar, and the peg head shapes, they're way too similar to be coincidence. Even the volute on the back of the peg head, you know, it's... But this was made in 21. So, basically, this also had trademarks and patents. And the Rettberg and Lang Company was very upset. And they even ran an article about how Gibson had stolen their design. And Gibson basically said, we got more money for our lawyers than you do. And it's uh, similar enough to what seems to happen in our industry today. But this banjo, obviously, from 21, was selling very well and it was eating Gibson's lunch so far as sales. So Gibson came up with that. Now, the ball bearing, Joe will soon explain that that was not the ultimate tone ring for Gibson and designs continued to evolve. But even to this day, this still looks like a modern banjo. And nobody had made a resonator that looked like that previous. This banjo here was definitely much more revolutionary than what Gibson had done. But if you look also inside this banjo, this resonator comes off pretty easily. You'll note that it has the early style dowel rod, not metal coordinator rods, and it has bracket shoes, screws through the rim, which is a much older design. So Gibson did have some features that Paramount didn't have, but when it comes right down to what it looks like and a lot of the basic design features, it's abundantly clear that Gibson was not above copying somebody else's work, but then they would, instead of just simply doing a copy only, they could tweak it. And actually, that's a long tradition in the musical instrument industry. For example, when C.F. Martin came to the U.S. in 1833, I can't get that resonator on right, uh, his guitars were basically copies pretty precise copy of the work of Johann Jörg Stauffer of Vienna, but Martin had worked for Stauffer for 10 years, and then went back to Mark Nekirchen in Saxony, where his family was from, and he wanted to make guitars, but his family was members of the Furniture Makers Guild, and the Violin Makers Guild had a monopoly on musical instrument making in Mark Nekirchen, and rather than 
he, he did go to court. He actually won, but it still got to be so much hard feelings. He, he felt it was easier to just move to New York. So Martin came from Germany, Saxony. Germany didn't yet exist as a nation unified till the late 1800s. So in 1833, when he came, he was coming from Saxony, not from Germany, because there was no such company known at, country known as Germany. But um, by even 18, very early 1840s, Martin was copying <coughs> Spanish designs. And when you look at Gibson guitars, their flat tops, you'll note that uh, starting in 1929, Gibson made guitars that had body shapes that were way too much for coincidence looking like Martin. And they used X bracing that was very, very similar to Martin's. So that's been the way musical instrument making has always been. Violin makers copied and yeah, that's just, that's the tradition of musical instruments. Are questions allowed? Yes. Um, a fair amount, I've seen a few, um, I think probably later models and they were always really ornate. Mm -hmm. um, is that something they did in response to Gibson's seal on their design? And when did they uh, stop making man banjos? The uh, Paramount uh, made lots of models. The style A was one of the least expensive in their so-called professional line. Uh, they made A through F, uh, but they also had, uh, they did have one model below the A, but it didn't have a letter. The, the, basic, the basic line was A through F, and F was really fancy. Yeah. But uh, each model got progressively more and more fancy. So by the time you got to the uh, style D, they were gold-plated and engraved. But, um, and the, but uh, by the time the style C on up had carving on the heel of the neck and on the back of the peg head and had considerably more elaborate inlay, although this still has pretty elaborate inlay on the peg head. But uh, yeah, Paramount also made uh, the Artist Supreme model uh, back, uh, that was very early 1930s, but uh, they went out of business during the late 30s. And uh, the tenor banjo craze pretty well ended at very close to 1930. So Gibson, by the time Gibson came out with the flathead banjo that we think is so great, which they did not design with bluegrass in mind. Bluegrass didn't exist yet, and the number of country music players who could afford a master tone like a Granada was very, very limited. But basically, Gibson came out with the F5 mandolin just in time for the mandolin boom to be completely over and dead. And uh, people might as, they had the best mandolin ever, but it wouldn't kickstart sales. You might as well have the best buggy whip in the world after the invention of the automobile. They didn't, the F5 was of no interest to anybody until bluegrass came along. It was too late for classical and it was almost 20 years too early for bluegrass. That was the lore model? Right. Yeah, the, the lore signed F5s made from 22 through the end of 24 uh, were over 20 years early for bluegrass because bluegrass didn't exist before 1945. It waited for me. <laughs> I arrived in August of 45 and so did bluegrass. Very important. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm so important several years ago for my birthday, everybody was looking up at the sky in total awe. In a 40 mile wide band across the country, everybody was looking up at the sky for my birthday. Is it your <laughs> I turned the sun off. So, uh, but uh, I read a book about that. Once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I'm very, I'm very powerful in a lot of ways. But um, <laughs> at, at any rate, that gets far enough that I'd like to introduce Joe, and Joe and I can trade comments back and forth. So, and. Um, I'm perfectly happy to take questions almost any time. Does anybody else have a question for me before I turn it over to Joe? Over here. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of a really silly question, but you were talking about the 
the banjo being like what, two, 270. How does that equate in dollars now? Have you ever figured that out? Like is it a couple of thousand? Oh, well, no, it's a whole lot more than a couple thousand. Um, if, you, if you use the government statistics, which I don't, um, then you'd multiply by at least about 30 to 35. But if you use what I consider the real statistics, you'd have to multiply by at least 60. Uh, get out an old Sears catalog from that same time, or a Ward catalog, and look what things that you are familiar with cost back then. And you'll notice typically it's about 60 times. Uh, or you can look at, uh, in the 1930s, a D28 Martin was $100. And the D45 was 200 and the dealer cost was half that. And Martin sold some of those things through distributors, like when Gene Autry got his D45 custom guitar in 1933, the very first one, it was ordered through CMI, Chicago Musical Instrument Company, which in 44 actually bought Gibson. But uh, the point is they were a distributor and Martin sold some instruments through them. And the invoice that Martin sent to CMI for that guitar was $80. And they had to make money on that. And in 44, Gibson was sold to, uh, to CMI, Chicago Musical Instrument Company, which had been around longer, but they bought Gibson in 44. Uh, in 1959, the Sunburst Les Paul, which today I can sell for 300,000 plus, if it has beautifully figured wood, I can get 400,000 plus. But they cost $265 new in 1959. Dealer cost was half that, but CMI got one third of the wholesale. So when Ted McCarty was running Gibson, he had to make that guitar for half of 265 minus 30 percent and still have enough profit to keep the doors open and pay employees. They obviously couldn't pay them very much, but um, it's uh, prices, times have changed. Even uh, I opened up my store in January of 70 and it was considered a good wage if I paid my repairmen three dollars an hour. Um, wouldn't seem so good now. Uh, but I was also selling things like you know, Lore F5 mandolins were in 70, around $1,750. Uh, 1959 ES335 Gibson today would bring 50 to 60,000, 400 bucks. And banjos were not as expensive as today. So it's. Um, but basic rule of thumb is take prices of the 1920s through the 30s, because during the 30s, prices didn't go up. The Depression had hit, and prices were, they didn't go up at all. In fact, the Style Three Master Tone was originally $115. And then during the Depression, it went down to $100, and then later during the Depression, they basically discontinued the Style 3, and they made something that looked mighty similar, the, RB, the Style 75, and it was $75. And today, if you were to buy an original five-string flathead RB75, it would bring a lot of money, but not as much. Actually, the market's down from where it was at its peak. But still, it would bring more money than a Gibson All-American, and the All-American cost $550 during the 30s. So what's desirable now is not always in direct proportion in price to what they cost when new. Um, lots of things that were expensive new are not so sought after now, or in the Gibson line and in the Martin line, um, an F9 archtop F-hole Martin guitar was $250 back when a D45 was $200. But a good D45 will bring 350 to 400,000, and a good F9 
nine on a good day might bring 25,000. So times change. And for that matter, if you look at old accordion catalogs, there were accordions that were as much as 650 to $700 in the 1930s that you would probably, if you had the same one in good condition now, with luck, you might get 650 to 700 for it today, <laughs> if you were lucky. Um, anyway, Joe, I'm sure, has more he'd like to add, and uh, we'll both be available for questions, and I may interject a few comments as well as it goes through.